great. I'm starting to see more videos pop up. Awesome. So hi, everyone. My name is Sharice Sullivan. I am the president of the MCBMA, and we are happy for you all to join us today um, to celebrate Black History Month by having a, uh, a panel with a, uh, several of our colleagues who are Black veterinary specialists. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Miss Roxanne Sanchez, who's going to be our moderator and host for this evening. And she is our community outreach chair. Thanks. Thank you, Sharice. Um, so like Sharice said, I'm Roxanne Sanchez. I am the current community outreach chair for the MCVMA, and I am a certified veterinary technician. I've been certified for eight years um, in the state of Illinois and Wisconsin. Um, so basically, we just wanted to put this discussion panel together um, to shed light on what it's like navigating the Black experience as a vet specialist. So we've got four panelists here for you guys tonight. Um, we're basically going to treat this as an informal, casual discussion. I've got questions that I'm going to ask them, and then they'll respond and kind of talk amongst themselves um, as friends and peers. If you guys have questions, you can go ahead and input them in the chat, and we'll try to get them at the end of the segment. If we don't get to your question and you're dying to ask it, you can always shoot me an email. I'll put my email in the chat as well, so you guys can email it me, email it to me, and I will send it to the doctors accordingly. Um, so I will have Dr. Mundy, start with her introductions and then kind of go down the line that way. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for um, the invite to speak. Um, my name is Trisha Mundy. I am a veterinary ophthalmologist. I'm um, originally from London. I went to university in Cambridge, then did my internship at the Royal Vet College. Then I moved to the States to do my fellowship at Wisconsin and then my residency at Cornell. Um, I practiced clinical ophthalmology uh, probably up until exclusively about two years ago. And um, I then went on to complete a master's at Penn Law in diversity uh, and inclusion and contract law. So uh, I, I, I guess I still do some clinics um, about two days a week, but most of the work that I do now is kind of focused on diversity and inclusion and also helping people navigate contracts. I'm looking forward to um, speaking with everybody. next. <laughs> Hi, I'll go next. Um, I'm Keisha Davis. Um, I'm a veterinary surgeon just south of Boston. Um, a couple of my old interns are on this, which is great um, in the audience. So hi. Um, I did, I went to vet, I grew up in Texas, uh, went to vet school at Cornell and I graduated in 99, um, undergrad there too. And then um, worked for a couple of years out in San Francisco and then went back to NC State and specialized in my internship and residency there. Um, a brief fellowship uh, at Wisconsin um, and then taught at Florida for a year before I came to the Boston area. So I've been here for about 15 years or so. Um, and I'm at a, a VCA, uh, VCA South Shore, just south of Boston. And we do have um, a million doctors there, um, internship program, all the, all the good things, so. All right, this is my turn. I'm Lily Davis. I am an oncologist in small animal medicine. I finished my residency at Cornell in 2018 and then moved to the Philly suburbs. Before that, I did I spent a third of my life at Cornell. I did my undergrad there, my vet school there, um, went quickly to Indiana to do my internship and then went back to Cornell to finish my residency. Um, and I'm originally from the Bronx, New York. And I'm very honored to be on this panel tonight. Good afternoon or good, good evening, I guess. Uh, everyone, I'm uh, Forrest Cummings. I'm uh, originally from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, where I reside now, but uh, went to my undergrad at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. And after that, uh, started vet school at the uh, at Tuskegee University. Um, went to do an internship at UT Knoxville, uh, just a rotating small animal. And actually took about two years off before my residency started 
uh, just to kind of break the monotony of going straight from internship to residency. Um, internal medicine is something I always wanted to do, but I just felt like I needed to, I need to be my own doctor, if that makes sense, for a little while before I went back in to do a residency. Um, so I lived in Florida for a couple of years in Estero, Southwest Florida, and then came back to do my internal medicine residency at Metropolitan Vet Specialist uh, with Dr. Catherine Daly, who's also another Tuskegee grad, 89, and <clears throat> currently work at Blue Pearl. So I was there from 2008, 2014, and then started Blue Pearl in Louisville in 2014 until I'm still there right now. All right. Thank you for all those introductions. Um, we have a pretty impressive panel. Um, I'm not sure if you guys read the bios on all of these prestigious veterinarians, but they've got pretty extensive education underneath their belt um, and they're doing great things. So we will start with um, the questions right off the bat. Dr. Mundy, I wanna address this one to you and then we can have the other three chime in as needed. Um, but the first question I've got for you is when you're pursuing your degree, did the university demographics and diversity hold a lot of weight in your decision-making? Um, why or why not? I, I, I actually visited this conversation um, a couple of years ago when I was back in London with one of my mentors. And um, like most people that want to go to veterinary school, you start going to visit practice when you're like 15, 14 and working in shelters, working in rescues. And I remember starkly realizing that I didn't actually see anybody that looked like me until actually my internship year. So I, I started 15 and that was probably what, 25, 10 years later. And the way that the system's set up in England is there's only six vet schools. So unless you're gonna to go to a historically black university, which we don't have, I was acutely aware that wherever I went was gonna be predominantly white. And so for me, I kind of, it was helpful to know that it was gonna be like that. So I was kind of prepared with my support system at home away from the university. But I was kind of aware that there wouldn't be that many people that looked like me. And I think in my year, there were um, two black people in my year. And I think there were probably a total of three in the whole vet school or five years. Um, so I kind of approached it as I wanted to go to vet school and that was kind of, the end of it. I really didn't put too much weight on the demographics because there wasn't really an option to have a choice. Uh, I like to touch on that as well. Um, going to UK, um, I, I mean, at the time it was four percent university wide out of twenty, almost twenty five thousand students. Four percent were black. Um, mm -hmm and even less than that in the College of Agriculture. Um, so when I, when I started, you know, I just knew, hey, I wanna go be a vet. You know, I, don't, I didn't really have the option at the time to pick and choose, because at the time there were only seven, 27 schools to choose from. Um, you know, and and I, I felt it at UK. You know, I, I had instances where you know, I was, you know, I felt isolated. I was the only one, but kind of keeping that end goal in mind of, well, I know it's not a lot of me around here to, to trying to achieve this goal. So, uh, but when I applied to vet school, uh, you know, I had the same mindset. I gotta, I gotta get to vet school. I'm trying to be a vet, and I did. It didn't weigh too heavily on me. But one of my mentors, uh, he was, you know, he he said, "Hey, you really gotta look at Tuskegee." I went there, and you know, I we were really good friends. Uh, grew to be really good friends at the time, and. There was a white guy, Todd Markham, but he was, he was just like, hey, I think you're gonna excel here. You know, and I applied to other vet schools and I didn't realize how isolating it was to try to achieve that goal and how, how comforting it was to be in a situation where I, I kind of felt like I wasn't the only person. Like I felt like I could just study, you know, if anybody can understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so it took some of that pressure off going there but I don't I don't think he directed it because I was black but I think he I think he just knew it was hard at the same time so he knew I had a goal in mind and you know he kind of put that in my head I share the same sentiment in that it didn't 
um, factor into my decision because, you know, as everyone has said already, my eye was set on the prize, which is getting into vet school. But I do remember my first day of vet school like it was yesterday because I sat in the auditorium of my whole class and I looked around and I was like, okay, there has to be at least another one of me, at least one other black student. And there was not. And I remember looking three times and it was not um, something that I had in my class. There were classes above me and below me who I noticed there were more than just one of us, you know, at least two or three. And in fact, it's, it's funny that Sharice, you're on this call because you were a few classes ahead of me. I think you were in vet school when I was an undergrad. And I remember like seeing you and going, okay, like this is something that I can do because she looks like me. And I've always kind of secretly looked up to you because, you know, you were, and you still are out here doing big things. And, you know, that was kind of a nice comfort to see someone who looks like me already in vet school, Cornell of all places, you know, that was really huge for me. And I don't think I've ever told you this until now. <laughs> so thank you just for being you. Um, but it's been hard. I feel like the higher I've gone in my career, the less Black people are around. And that's been pretty frustrating. But no, I was not prepared for the lack of diversity in vet med. It did not factor into my decision making. Dr. Keisha Davis, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I went to Cornell too. Apparently all the black vets did. <laughs> 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 um, it was horrible. Um, I actually tried to transfer out and couldn't transfer out. Nobody wanted a Cornell student because the curriculum's so weird, um, vet student. Um, but uh, it was very isolating. And Dr. Davis, what year did you graduate? I graduated in 2014. Wow, so I graduated in 1999 and we had the exact same experience. Wow. So that that should tell you something. Um, yeah. So we, I was very frustrated. There was one other vet student um, who was black, uh, Rebecca Price, and we sat together for every class. Um, and we were both so frustrated that we actually, um, I put on a conference with another um, student of color the year I was, the. the uh, my junior year of vet school and we invited people from all over to sort of see if everybody was having a similar experience and we had a hundred participants and everybody was having the same experience um, and I think it changed things a little bit um, but not significantly until very very recently um, and so um, it didn't the lack of diversity at Cornell didn't surprise me because I was there for undergrad but I felt like I didn't really have have much of a choice um, I didn't know a whole lot about Tuskegee, but I knew that, um, you know, my best chance of getting into vet school was at Cornell just because I had connections there. So, and it was, I knew what I was getting into and it was as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a little bit disappointed that 2014, it wasn't any better. So. And, and I think, uh, yeah. I, I didn't go to Cornell, but I did my residency at Cornell. And Therese, um, you were a student when I was a, a resident there. And what's even more heartbreaking is I left Cornell and then I went to, um, to Penn. And probably Therese's year is probably the most minority students I've seen in like the three years I was at Penn because the numbers haven't increased. So what was that? Cornell was something like 2009, I think, when I was there. And I think there was probably like for in your year. And I don't think I've worked in academia anywhere teaching students where there's been more than three or four in one year. Um, and I don't quite know where the shortcoming are, whether it's a visibility. And um, I did get involved in some AUMA initiatives. And I think there's also the um, financial component. And then there's also the, the kind of the, the, the pipe stream component as well. Um, and for me, there was also a cultural difference because I, I grew up in Zambia. And for me, my dad was essentially, you know, what are you doing with those animals? If you're going to be a doctor, be a real doctor. So there's also that <laughs> cultural element of it. Um, I don't know what the solution is, but it is heartbreaking. I agree with Dr. Davis um, that it's, it, it hasn't really improved that much um, in, in the, the whatever decade old period that we're, we're talking about.
Well, that's that's disheartening to hear. Um, but this is why we're doing a, a panel discussion like this to hopefully raise a, awareness and let people know what it's like um, and hopefully get more people who are or who were in the same position as you many years ago to feel comfortable enough to to do these things. Um, so with that in mind, um, Dr. Keisha Davis, I will aim my second question at you. Um, so what do you want slash what do you wish the veterinary community was more aware of in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, and you know, what would you like to see um, to maybe make, make this issue more visible? Um, what do I... Well, I mean, I think I think there's a common theme on all the all the panelists where unless you're extremely, extremely determined and like to have this singular mindset that this is what you want to do, you're probably not going to go into vet medicine. Um, and vet, vet, the vet, vet school itself is extremely hard, as we all know. Um, and then you add all of the racial stuff on top of it. And it's just impossible, I think, for most vet students to stay in if they're a person of color, um, let alone think about applying. And I don't think that same level of intimidation is there for white students. You know, you don't have to be so singular minded to, to think about getting in, to get in, to think that it's a possibility. Um, and so quite frankly, I think the only way to improve things is to improve the numbers. I mean, I think there are, what kid doesn't want to be a vet, you know, when they're growing up, they all love animals. So who, somewhere along the way, the message gets passed along that they just can't do it, you know? Um, and it's either in middle school or high school or college. Um, and so I think that the outreach needs to start in the elementary schools, you know? And the people need to be hiring more black um, doctors in the vet schools um, and just increase the numbers. You know, the fact that and the admission policies need to be better. I know when I was at NC State, they had a record number of black students in, in one of their freshman classes and they were so proud of it. And I think all but one or two dropped out. Um, and, you know, North Carolina is so black, like what, why can't they have more black students in that state? And none of them felt supported. And I'm sure they were all extremely smart and motivated, but it's the culture, you know, and um, having gone through it, I don't, you know, I don't blame them for, for, you know, dropping out. It doesn't really get better after you finish vet school. It really doesn't. So um, I think it's just a matter of improving the culture. And I think the only way to do it is to improve the numbers. And it, it probably starts when kids are young so that they know they can do it. I mean, I just wanted to kind of just follow up on that about it doesn't get better when you leave. And I think what I, I could do this again. What I'd hope some of the conversations somebody would have had with me is the microaggressions continue when you're done vet school and they continue when you're a specialist to the point where I've lost count of the number of times where I'll have a white nurse in the exam room and I'm at a new clinic because I do like a mobile ophthalmology service and a, a fellow veterinarian will come in and go to my nurse and say, hi, Dr. Mundy, because it's beyond the scope for him that this specialist could be a black person. And that happens repeatedly. And there was also, there was also when I was training residents as well, they definitely had, I don't know if it's a respect thing, but the old white dude or the, the white specialist, probably they kind of saw more value to what they said than what I said. And there's those kind of microaggressions that I think we have to prepare vet students for if we're gonna retain them. And I've seen lots of, um, vet students once they finish leaving the industry altogether and going into like corporate pharma. And I think for me, that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of leaving slowly, kicking and screaming and going into law because it, it does get exhausting. And I think we need to have these conversations with vet students so they know that it's not like you get in and it stops. This is gonna be like a, a, a career wide thing. And I don't think there's enough of a push to improve the numbers, certainly in the years that we've been doing this combined, which is probably like 20, 25 odd years, the numbers haven't improved that significantly. And so as long as you're kind of prepared for that, then you kind of go in with your eyes open 
and you can kind of make strategic decisions about where you want to go like don't go and live in a very very white town where you won't have a support system just small things like that that you kind of have to make your village around outside your profession because you won't always get that in your profession yeah i agree with dr mundy the microaggressions continue unfortunately um i've become more aware of them with age i feel like the older i get the more i'm like okay yep there there it is again especially if i walk in the room for the first time and introduce myself as dr davis the oncologist and like you know i get like an oh you know like or a look of some sort um, in terms of like what I'd like to change, there's so many things, and this is not a problem that I think has like one simple solution, but the financial aspect of that school has to be taken into consideration. Um, I grew up in the Bronx, New York. I grew up in poverty. You know, I was one of those kids who I did, I grew up in a single mother household, I don't know my dad, you know, like there were many days, weeks, months that, you know, we would scrape by um, only to get to vet school where, you know, like the majority of my classmates have families and parents who are paying their rent and their gas and their cell phone bill. And I didn't even know how to drive when I got to vet school because I'm from New York City. So I had a lot of things to catch up on and still do. I still feel like that now, you know, a lot of my friends because they had that help from parents, you know, like, and they weren't stacking up the 300 plus $400,000 of debt, you know, that I now have. And I'm not saying this is everybody, but, you know, definitely as a minority, the financial aspect, I had to do it all on my own. And I'm paying for it now and feeling like I have to catch up, you know, I'm trying to pay off these loans, but I still want to buy my first house. I want to have a baby, you know, like there's just a lot of things you know, that I didn't realize um, going into vet school, because again, I just, we I had my, my, my sights set on this one goal, but that was pretty hard, you know, to have my friends around me. And I have some wonderful, loving, you know, supportive friends, but to see that, you know, their parents can chip in and save the day at any point was really tough. So I think overall education needs to be cheaper throughout the United States, but especially for vet school, there's no way in hell that somebody can go from poverty to owing a house <laughs> in 12 years and that being okay. Um, it's just not how it works and it still puts us behind the ball. So that's just my two cents. Now, I, like, I like to make a comment on that as well. Um, you know, I mean, again, we're kind of talking about, you know, how do we, how do we just increase the number? You know, what can vet schools do? What can we do with veterinarians? And I think by the time most people get to college, they've made a decision. You know, they have a few choices that they've narrowed it down to. And unfortunately at that time, they may not even have considered vet medicine you know, or the sciences in general. Um, you know, I, I don't know what, I mean, we had, we had dogs growing up. I shouldn't say animals, we had dogs growing up. And, you know, it was just something I was naturally drawn to. But even in the inner city of Kentucky, I was, you know, amongst my friends, they were like, why do you want to be a vet? You know, like it, it was, there, were, there were no black vets that we saw. You know, it's not like we were, you know, going to the vet clinic and hanging out there and doing things. It was just something I wanted to do. So, you know, try to increase the exposure. How do you do it from at the vet school level? I'm not really sure. You know, I don't know if they have the resources to to what to help, you know, get into elementary school. But I think that's where it really starts. You know, I mean, kids are so easily molded, you know, to be, I want to do this, you know. And, and right now, you know, unfortunately for black males, it's always athletes and, you know, some form of entertainment, you know. And, you know, the odds of you achieving that on a professional level are a lot lower than becoming a veterinarian. So, you know, I think I think it's the exposure side of it. Um, I recently just joined the the, uh, the Louisville Zoo board, and with with part of that is my mission. You know, I want to try to help out. You know, the and reach the youth, like reach the minorities, to you know expose them not only just to animals, but hey, not only are there animals that you can work with, but you know, I look like you, and you know, I grew up in the same neighborhood as you did, so you know, it's possible. Whereas, you know, a lot of my friends just blew it off. 
you know, and not not talking down to me blew it off, but I said they just weren't exposed to it until I said, hey, I think I'm going to do this. But I don't, I don't know how to how to get the vet school resources into those situations. I don't even like to know if it's something that's even in discussion. I, I, I agree that the exposure and outreach needs to be improved for sure. I had nothing of the sort growing up. Um, you know, another thing that I want to add, you know, just as a point is, you know, a lot of people who are minorities and who live um, in the inner city, for example, like they can't afford vet care. Um, so like I grew up with pets my whole life, but like, did we have the money to take them to a veterinarian? No, I think I learned that there were animal doctors when I was in my like young teenage years. And that's when I started to do my own research, but um, that has to be a part of it too, is that it's just, it's taking care of pets is a luxury that not everybody can afford. So if that's the case, then how do we get these black veterinarians in front of these children, um, I guess going to their schools, uh, cause definitely not everyone's going to be bringing their pets to the vet, but that's just, just wanted to add that. And I think um, also, um, just when it comes to finances, England is a slightly different system because education is free. Well, it was when I went to school, so I, I didn't come out with any debt, but you could still see there was a huge, so when we, and I, I was also a um, single parent family, two bedroom tenement housing, like multiple generations all in the same house, but you can still see there's a discrepancy in um, the amount of black students at vet school to the black students at medical school or the law school. And I think it does come down to exposure. And I think that's why it's been so wonderful to see um, um, Joya Griffin, if you haven't seen the show, by the way, plug that for us. I'm surprised you didn't plug this. Um, actually having like a, a black female veterinary dermatologist on a syndicated national show, I think is just absolutely immense. And it's not uh, 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 somebody who hasn't kind of gone through all the scores, like she's done all the schooling, like, it's set up by herself, it's smart, it's beautiful, it's engaging. And it's kind of presenting minority special medicine in like positive light that it's, 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 it's mind blowing to me. And I think it's stuff like that, that actually encourages people to, to, to even consider vet school because it's not something that you would normally consider if, unless you, you come from a place where you, you're exposed to veterinarians. Um, Dr. Cummings, uh, do you want to shamelessly plug your wife since not everybody knows what uh, Dr. Mundy is talking about really quickly? Yeah, yeah. So my wife, Joya Griffin, <clears throat> she um, uh, has a show on Nat Geo Wild and Disney Plus, but it's uh, Pop Goes to Vet with Dr. Joya. Uh, they started filming um, when, I guess, early 2020 um, or 2021. Yeah, early 2021, and just wrapped it up, um, you know, eight seasons, hopefully get a second season. I will find that out, hopefully, within the upcoming week, so fingers crossed on that one. But, yeah, I mean, it, it highlights just that, you know, a lot of people are asking to bring their kids to the clinic, and she's had a lot of children, you know, say, oh, wow, this is, you know, I want to be a vet, you know, but it's, it's children, and that's the most important thing. I mean, you have to plant that seed early, and, and vet school and education in general is expensive, but, um, but you know, if you plant that seed early, you know, you can, you can accomplish a lot of things, you know, with, with appropriate planning, you know, uh, even though the debt can seem crazy in the beginning, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, this show has touched a lot of people, a lot of young people in particular, uh, and even adults, you know, but, you know, the, the kids are really what, what I like about it. I'll be interested to see, um, I don't know if Joya is still around, just the feedback she's getting from, from the, the young people she's, she's meeting. Um, if she's not hiding in the basement, she's probably back in the basement. She, she's hiding in the basement. She's hiding in the basement, because I think there's, and it, it, they, the students, that she, when I looked at the pictures, they're not just minority, they're just like from across the board, all races were actually. Oh, there she is. I am listening. <laughs> um, it has been across the board. 
it's been across the board. Um, children, parents, Instagramming me, Facebooking me saying, you know, my child you know, wants to be a vet because of you, especially little girls and children of color, little girls and children of color saying, you know, I see you ch children playing to be Dr. Joya, playing with their toys. And I mean, it's just the cutest, cutest thing. And uh, we've had lots of children. We have children coming every week to visit the clinic. And, you know, that means a lot. Like, I, I think I didn't really expect that to come out of the show. And that's been the most amazing part of it. Oh, thank you so much for your little cameo, Dr. Cummings. Um, but, um, Dr. Mrs. Cummings, right? So it's actually it's actually Dr. Griffin. I never took Dr. His name Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm woman, hear me roar. So he oh, me. thank you I so much, Dr. Legally, Griffin. but not professionally. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Griffin. <laughs> thank you. Of course. All right. So you know that's a perfect segue into the next question that I have. That um, I'll direct to Dr. Lily Davis here. Um, speaking of role models and um, little kids you know, seeing Dr. Griffin on TV and wanting to be just like her. Um, who were your role models that helped you when you were feeling discouraged or someone that you guys, that you could look up to um, when you needed encouragement and when you were feeling down? Yeah, I had, I was very fortunate to have a lot of mentors along my journey to kind of like help me navigate, you know, getting into college, getting into vet school, getting an internship, getting a residency, I would say like at every step in my life, I can pinpoint multiple mentors who are probably my direct like teachers or professors or faculty members who just gave me a chance, which I really, really appreciate. Um, I mean, there's so many people I can name. Thankfully, there's not just one person. Um, unfortunately, none of them were black. Um, the majority of my mentors are white. Um, and that, you know, still means the world to me. It doesn't downplay their significance and impact on my life. But as I said earlier, you know, seeing Sharice, you know, a, a, few, a few years ahead of me, I was like, okay, like, cool. Like she's there. Then I had, you know, um, black vet students in classes above me who were very like welcoming and took me under their wing and just, you know, kind of there to, to help guide me. But, um, I would say short answer is I have many mentors, thankfully, um, but unfortunately none that look like me. I have, I have to agree. Um, when I was, uh, I mean, I guess my mentors have been kind of like in different phases of my career, um, leading up to vet school and um, internship and residencies, none of them were minorities. And I think if you're kind of going to go into veterinary medicine wanting a mentor that looks like you, you're going to be very, very disappointed. And I think you're better off getting a mentor that's going to support you or kind of instead of kind of like searching for this unicorn. Um, I was very lucky when I was um, a Cornell, actually, this is like, this is like the Joya fan club. I promise you I don't have a back tattoo of her face, but um, she was um, the resident above me. And I really struggled when I was a resident. Um, I was in a new country and I think it was nice to just have somebody who looked like me in, in the, the residency program, although we were in different programs, but she'd take me to church on a Sunday and just kind of include me in all her friends. Um, and I think the other thing that is also very important is um, Fender Medicine has evolved so much over the past couple of years, it's becoming more and more corporate. And I think one of the most valuable mentors I've had after my residency is actually, um, He's actually an investment banker that works at Accenture. So he has absolutely nothing to do with veterinary medicine, but he kind of understands the, the business of, because veterinary medicine is a business now. And so it, it's nice to just kind of have a sit down with him and, and kind of have conversations about what I'm going through and like the HR stuff and the microaggressions and how to approach those, because not many people not many people who, who don't look like this, who are our white mentors can actually navigate the microaggression conversations. Whereas he works in an investment bank, they, they, they deal with microaggressions and that kind of. So I think um, I've come to the realization that you can look up to people, but don't expect the mentors to mentor you, to look like you or even be in the same profession as you. Just try and seek out people that um, one, have the time 
and also have the interest in actually supporting you and kind of advising you. Awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to, to piggyback on that. Um, I mean, I, I think a common theme that, you know, we keep talking about is that there's a huge wealth gap in this country with, you know, black people in general. Um, and it, it definitely applies to veterinary medicine um, and it creates a huge um, obstacle for us just to enter the profession. And then there's also a huge power gap um, where, you know, I can't think of too many black people that are so powerful in universities where they can make the sea change, you know, to, to create the numbers that we need to see or that own, you know, these high um, profit especially practices or large chains of, um, uh, general practices, you know, we just don't have that, that there's that same power um, gap as well. And I think because of that, um, you know, finding a mentor that can make a meaningful impact other than encouraging you is difficult, you know, in this profession. Um, like everybody else, my, um, my mentors before vet school were both white. Um, and one was just a vet student who got me a job working in ICU at Cornell. And that just sort of kept me focused, you know, so, so that I kept reapplying and trying to get in. Um, and she's a great person. But I don't think she meant to be a mentor. We would just hang out. But that was, you know, it was kind of a random mentor. And I didn't meet a black veterinarian until I was in vet school. And then he wasn't even my mentor. He was the only black person on faculty. So he got assigned to, you know, me and my classmate to be some kind of a mentor. Super nice guy, but, um, just not, you know, who I needed to be to be a surgeon. And it took longer um, to be a surgeon because there was no one there to really help me navigate. Um, and I think it's gonna continue to be that hard um, until there's enough people in place, until there's that power and equity is gone. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, just like what Dr. Bundy saying, by moving into these spaces that aren't veterinary, but they know what should be done, you know, where they know what HR should look like, you know, not this weird HR that vet medicine has, but like real HR, um, that we can really start to see some kind of a change. So. I mean, I'm, I'm similar. My experience is with my role model. Um, you know, my, I didn't have, you know, anybody until I got to undergrad and started working at a clinic, you know, and it was Dr. Markham. Um, again, you know, but not a person of color, you know, but he he kind of took me under his wing immediately. And, you know, he saw that I wanted to do it and he told me what I should and shouldn't do. Um, even to the point of when I started vet school, I came back home to work for the summer just to try to, you know, I would work over the summer to basically pay my rent for the upcoming school year. And so I was working said, Dr. Mark, I need a job. And he, he said, no, I'm not going to hire you because I've done what I can do to get you into vet school. Now your job should be passing the NAVLE. And I want you to work with my classmate, uh, Dr. Catherine Daly, who ended up being my resident advisor. Uh, I didn't know I wanted to do internal medicine until I met her. And so he, he basically fired me, <laughs> you know, unofficially from my undergrad job because you know, he, I mean, that's what a role model should do. They should guide you in the right direction. And he didn't even keep me on as cheap labor for the summer. But, you know, he always had, you know, my best interest at heart in that sense. And Dr. Daly pretty much took it over. And, you know, I worked with her for the summers over vet school. And it was, you know, it was just like an extension of that, you know. Um, you know, she would, she would grill me. You know, I, we'd see a case. She knew I didn't know anything about anything you know, at that point, but she was like, well, here's my textbooks, take them home, read them, here's the disease process, tell me what you know, we have a conversation about it later on this week, you know, and it was, it was that type of mentorship and role model that, you know, made me feel like, oh, I can get through this, you know, these two people believe I can do it, so it kind of took some of that pressure off when I was in vet school, you know, but those two, you know, by far, probably the biggest role models I've had in this whole career. I still talk to them to this day. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I'm getting to the last question here, and this one is for you, Dr. Cummings. Um, so the last question I have for you this evening is, 
do you have any advice for someone who may just be starting out but facing the same hurdles and barriers that you have made, that you have faced early on in your career? Uh, I mean, yeah, the, the probably the best advice I can give is, I mean, it's going to be hard, you know, expect that, you know, not just vet school, but, you know, even the process of getting to vet school and what was mentioned earlier, it doesn't change just because you graduate. You know, the pressure is, doesn't just go away. You know, I've had, <clears throat> I've had the same experiences of, you know, walking into a, into a vet clinic and going into my first job and, you know, hey, I'm Dr. Cummings. And they look at me, you know, like, no, you're not, you know. Um, you know, and I was really young, you know, I looked young. Um, but that's still no excuse to give somebody such a disrespectful look. You know, it's like, why would I lie? You know, but it's, it's that type of stuff where you just have to, you just have to accept that some people are going to be that way uh, to not let it affect you, you know, and, and to take it and learn from it. But, you know, those experiences are, are real and they can be hurtful <clears throat> because, you know, the whole time I'm like, I went through a lot of schooling and, you know, you still don't even have the decency to call me doctor. You know, they, I've had clients early, especially early on in my career, where they would say Forrest. And I'm like, I'd never introduced myself as Forrest. Nowhere along this path, you know, but they read my name on my jacket and thought it was okay to call me Forrest. You know, um, you know, but it's that type of stuff where I, you know, honestly, I wanted to say things and say what was on my mind in that situation, but you know, it would, it would just feed into that, that stereotype that they already had about me anyway. So, you know, it, it helped me to become more professional in those situations and to deal with the ignorance, uh, you know, but, but those things, I don't, hopefully they change, but, you know, they're always going to be there. And, uh, you know, I just tell people to try to stay focused, you know, realize that you are somebody, you got here for a reason. You know, it wasn't a mistake, you know, and just kind of take that and run with, you know, be confident in you. I mean, I, I, I just to follow up from, from what Forrest said, it's, it's kind of struck me actually. Um, one of the microaggressions that I faced, especially even from my residents and um, nurses, is um, they would call me Monday. They call everybody else Dr. Something. I mean, I, I, Dr. Labor, I don't really, I don't lose too, sleep, too much sleep over. You can call me Patricia or Dr. Mundy, but you just refer to me as Mundy. And that's the kind of little subtle microaggression that um, I've experienced. And I think one of the things that I learned pretty quickly is that the burnout is real. Don't forget with all the other shenanigans that comes with veterinary medicine, you have all this kind of race stuff on top of that. and. And I think I've been very public about my struggles with mental health and I actually had a breakdown. I took seven months off. And the best advice that I can give to people is it's okay to stop and just take like time off, take care of yourself. Don't, you don't have to fight every battle because you can't win them all. And I think it's okay to just give yourself some room to breathe. And the other thing that I, I wish I'd have learned quickly is there's jobs out there. If you're in a toxic work environment, I know it's really hard to change jobs, but I guarantee you, you'll get a job somewhere else and not every job is a job for you. Um, and I always say to myself, if you fall down dead on clinics tomorrow, they'll be sad, they'll have a potluck, they'll like mourn you, but you know, and then they'll replace you real quick. So, it's not worth like, you know, dying on clinics for, for, for like, just because they're, they're driving you crazy. Just um, choose you. I agree with Dr. Mundy, mental health first. Um, this profession is no doubt very challenging, very difficult. You add in, you know, being a black person and it just makes it that much tougher. Um, I mean, my pearls of wisdom would be to take care of yourself, as Dr. Mundy said, put your mental health first, put yourself first. Um, one thing I noticed a little bit later in life, actually recently in the past two years, is that I, as I 
got further and further in my career and I became the only black person, you know, in my, in the room, you know, in the hospital, I found that I kept trying to prove to others and to myself that I deserve to be here. Um, because deep down inside, I don't know where this came from other than society, I felt like I didn't belong, you know, and I remember I had a classmate actually in vet school. Um, I got an opportunity that she didn't, she was white, I was black. My other friend who is Latina also got the same opportunity and she said, oh, you only got it because you guys are minorities. <laughs> and because, you know, they're just looking to hand out, you know, things to you guys and that kind of stuck and my re reaction to that is like oh yeah well let me show you that like not only do I belong here but like I work my ass off to be here and I'm going to stay here and that's just the stubborn in, in me but that did lead to me burning out pretty fast because I was like doing doing go 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 people pleasing just like you know trying to balance being social but but assertive but but not too assertive but nice and it's just it's a, it's a really hard balance don't let anyone make you feel like you don't belong ever it's easier said than done but I'm still kind of grappling with that too and then the third thing is you know especially if you're like me and you come from you know the inner city and poverty just really, 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 really spend some time. I know we don't have that much time, you know, trying to become vets or veterinary specialists, but try to spend some time becoming financially literate because I do feel like that's something that I was not brought up with. And I kind of just learned financial literacy in the past like two to five years. So, you know, um, just really, really, when your financial advisor or the loan, student loan officer is like, are you sure you need that much money? Like truly think about it, especially if you're going at this by yourself. Um, I can keep going, but those are the, the top three things. Thank you. Um, so just a kind of a follow-up question. So we were, I'm going through the chat, reading some of the, the questions here. And um, there, so we talked about how in veterinary school and undergrad, there weren't very many um, people of color in those situations. Did it get worse or did it get any better um, when you guys were doing your internships or your residencies or even within your specialties? Um, are, is it worse in specialty? Is it, is it better? Um, so I, I just wanted to know, you know, maybe there's hope. Um, I, can, I can speak to that. Um, um, I do think, I mean, I had a very similar um, experience with Dr. Davis like twins, um, where I had, when I was an intern, I was cornered by a resident who told me that I didn't belong. And I was only there because I was, because I was black and I was really upset. Um, and I took it to the hospital director um, the next day or a couple of days later to tell her that this had happened. Um, and she was a white woman um, and a surgeon, so I, I liked her. Um, and she didn't really know me, I didn't know her, but she basically told that resident that if she didn't go to sensitivity training, she would be fired and that resident quit. Um, and I felt really supported and that was the first week of my internship. So I felt really supported by the college. And I mean, the, they did a hundred other things, the opposite of that throughout my internship, you know, but that just felt like a, a really supportive environment. And I, and I also, um, in my residency, I didn't really have that many direct racism from my peers um, that I had, like, like I had my internship. Um, and I felt like, and I still feel like now that as I became more and more specialized, I felt like I had more of a voice and a little more power in the clinic um, than I did as a GP doctor. Um, and so I do think that there's something to that, um, that, did, that does give me, you know, quite a, a bit of hope that there's room for change you know, if you do specialize, you can maybe make an impact, you know, in the academic environment to that degree. Um, but it is very isolating. You know, the higher up you go, the less black people there are. And if there's only two to begin with, <laughs> that just leaves you, you know. Um, and so, you know, it is, it is what it is. And those residency spots are coveted. And so they go to, you know, usually the whitest candidate that they can find, so. 
And, and I just to kind of follow up on that, I think the numbers reduce as you go higher up you go, but there was something Dr. Davis mentioned earlier, which I actually hadn't thought about, um, the power and the equity. That's the bit that kind of improves as you get better. And I remember there was a particular client who was flying in to, um, I won't even mention the university where I was faculty and they were flying in by private jet and they, I was in clinics and the um, head of fundraising came to tell me this big donor's coming in, but um, they want to see one of the other faculty. And I was a bit like, why I'm the only one in clinics. And I guess my mentor at the time came up to me and said to me, yeah, this is, this is a, a race thing. And um, I was the only one in clinics, so I refused to see them. And that was the end of that. Um, and I think those are the things also, if you're in private practice, you, you have, if you're a specialty, you have the ability to fire clients probably a little bit easier because they did, there's not meaning PA, there's what there's five ophthalmologists in PA in New Jersey. They don't have many alternatives. And so they're kind of forced to behave themselves. So that's the bit that kind of improves with, um, with specializing, but the numbers do decrease um, the higher up you go. Yeah, um, I had, you know, I, I guess speaking on the firing clients, you know, I don't really fire a lot of clients, but I've, I've had those situations where, you know, I've had to, to talk stern, I guess, you know, to a few clients because of the disrespect, you know, they, they feel like they can talk over me. Um, you know, they'll, you know, in, you know, it's like you're coming to pay me to give you my advice on your animal, but then you shoot down every idea and tell me, no, that's not going to work. And it's like, you're questioning everything that I'm doing, um, you know, and, and I, I know for, I've had a few clients where, you know, where was, I'm the only intern is where I am right now, but at my old place where I fired the client, but they stayed in the clinic and went to my white colleague and, you know, for whatever reason, they never really had the problem with this, with these clients, you know, um, you know, now, you know, where I'm the only one and my mentor is at the other mm -hmm. hospital in town, you know, I'll just call her and say, hey, yeah, this person's this way. So, you know, they left me be careful, you know, um, so it, that is a luxury that you have, but it's sad that you have to kind of go to that extreme you know, to enforce that. Like, why do we even have to go here? You know, it should just be a level of understanding that I obviously know what I'm talking about or I wouldn't be in this situation. So, you know, how about, you know, you just respect that and not question everything about, you know, my knowledge base and take it, take it for what it's worth. Yeah, I've, I've had clients that I, I remember distinctly a few years ago, I had a client that I walked in and she said, you know, I don't want a black doctor. Um, and I just walked out of the room and refused to even go back in and there was nobody else on. I was like, I don't know what you want to do. Your dog's bleeding out. But, and that was that, you know, and I didn't get in trouble. Nothing happened. They went away and it just saves your sanity, you know, and, you know, if you're a, a GP and you're on your own practice or if you have a supportive practice, you can do that kind of stuff too, you know, um, and not be the victim, which is nice. Um, so, I, one of one of the most most stupid comments I've ever had was actually during my internship, and I actually laughed at the client in the room. Uh, but you know, in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, they were they were saying, "Oh, my dog doesn't like black people," and like. Like I laugh because it's like that is such a stupid statement, you know, that I'm going to laugh at it because, you know, that's the only thing I can do to acknowledge this comment. Um, but to say that my dog doesn't like black people. Um, and I'm like, why, why would you even say that? And they were like, well, I mean, just never seen anybody. And like, it, it was just, like I said, but it, <laughs> it, it was just a very odd, odd, odd comment. But yeah, my dog doesn't like black people. I've heard that too. My dog only barks at black people. Yeah. I'm a bit like, when well, I'm black, so we're an impasse. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like, like, yeah. Oh, that's just terrible. 
Um, so if I move along to the other questions in the chat, Dr. Kara Williams um, asks, have you all felt a burden of trying to be a mentor to too many students now or trying to provide what you didn't have? I kind of answered that and um, it's, I think it's a fabulous question and it's one that I did bring up to my therapist because, you know, during this day and age, I love that we're having these discussions, but I do think sometimes the pressures put on us, you know, very few black people to be the voice of change when in fact, we can't do all the work and we, we can't be the ones to enact that change. It has to be the predominantly white profession that does so. Um, but, you know, like along the lines of what Dr. Mundy said, you know, it's mentally challenging and exhausting to do this job and to do it as a minority. Um, so, you know, especially when George Floyd happened, you know, there's this big, you know, uptick of, you know, looking at um, justice for minorities, black people, you know, increasing awareness of diversity or lack thereof. And, I felt this external pressure to like be the voice for black veterinarians that I like, I didn't even have the bandwidth to do that. Um, I feel like I'm just getting to a place where I've focused on myself to kind of help others, but it's not easy. And it's, it's definitely not something I take lightly. So, so I haven't been like overwhelmed or burdened from being a mentor. I just, the idea of the fact that I wasn't doing enough mentorship to like in my own eyes or from hearing that from other people was just pretty like frustrating because I'm like well you know I have to take care of me first and then yes I can I can't pour from an empty cup um, especially coming from a background or you know an upbringing that had a lot of lacking um, you can't give what you what you don't have so um, I think that's a great question because I I feel like that kind of hit me like right here because it's kind of personal and um I don't know if other people feel this way but I just you know some days I don't want to be the spokesperson for black people and I don't think I should be or have to be um and it that day can be a month it could be a year but um it, it is definitely necessary for us to enact change but Kara thank you for that question and also hi <laughs> I think for me, um, the mentorship part, I'm actually okay with, but this definitely happened on the George Floyd. And there was actually a conversation on one of the VET Facebook pages, I think it was last week, where um, somebody who was a white colleague, was an ally, was very upset that um, like black people didn't drop everything to kind of uh, educate the fact that they're interested in what's going on, we should kind of make ourselves available. So I think for me, it's the actual allyship that I find exhausting. And there's almost an element of, of kind of have a conversation with me so you can absolve some of the white guilt that for me, I, 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 I don't have any time for. But if somebody wants me to be mentored or to kind of have this conversation, absolutely. But the allyship for me is what's exhausting. There's a there's a police shooting, then all of a sudden all my friends start posting about like, you know, this is awful, Black Lives Matter. But then they forget that Black Lives still matter. And that kind of stuff gets exhausting. So I think it's, um, and I don't think they realize the repeat of PTSD. I realize they're trying to kind of like be allies, but as one of their Black friends, given that it's on all their feeds and it, they're kind of like, it's in there, it's, that's exhausting. That's absolutely exhausting. That's a good distinction. Yes, it's not the mentorship, it's the allyship, you know, and the fact that like we should be the ones. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but the week or the month George Floyd happened, I got so many text messages and messages that I had to like sh shut my phone off. I was like, people I haven't talked to in years are asking me how I'm doing. And it was just, this is kind of getting a little off topic, but it, it speaks to your our point is that it's it's not the mentorship, it's like the allies who are like, you know, kind of hounding us to teach them and to be the spokesperson. It's like, but this is our life. Like George Floyd was very sad, but like, he's not the first and he won't be the last. So like, you know, I would have conversations with some of my closest friends and be like, unfortunately, I'm kind of not used to it. It's still heartbreaking and, and infuriating, but it wasn't something new to me, you know, but to have all of my friends who I, who I love dearly, like check on me, that was nice. But at the same time, it was really overwhelming. And that actually started me kind of like 
going internally and just being like, nope, 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 I don't have it for anybody. Like I'm just gonna wall myself off and take care of myself because I, I can't do this. Um, so Patricia, thank you for that distinction. Yeah, I, I actually disabled all social media when the George Floyd thing happened, just because it was just, it was just jarring. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I had I had a little in, I mean, you know, the same thing, you know, people would be the I would be the spokesman, you know, for the hospital on on race relations and police brutality. Um, you know, I and I say the same thing, you know, this is sad, but you know, this is nothing new. This was just caught on video, you know. Um, you know, and, and that usually shuts down a lot of conversations when you're just so blunt in your response. You know, because they're, you know, the people just think, oh, this is the isolated incident. You know, all these things that are happening, you know, even all the way back to really, I guess, Trayvon Martin, you know, um, you know, same thing, you know, just a few cases got in the news media and, you know, it took off. But, you know, this stuff has been happening and it unfortunately always will be happening. But, um, you know, as far as as far as mentorship. I don't, I don't know if I could have really been a, a mentor, you know, 10 years ago. I mean, just because, I mean, I was a vet, but I don't know if I had enough of, of life's experience in general um, to, to like honestly guide somebody, you know, uh, and teach them about things. You know, I'm just now starting to become comfortable and, and you know, trying to provide that for, like little kids, I always felt like I could, but you know, it wasn't until I I had to go through some things so that I could actually mentor, you know, people. Yeah, I haven't I haven't had a huge demand for mentoring um, from uh, for like black kids. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll get an email or something, but it's not that common. So I haven't had a huge. It hasn't felt like a burden. Um, and I initially, like you, Dr. Davis, felt like I should be mentoring more a lot, you know? Um, and it, what I began to realize pretty early in my career is that every time I walk out into the exam room, into the exam room and the waiting room, like you're already, just your presence and you being there, especially if you're in a very white hospital, um, if there's any black people in that waiting room, chances are you might be the first black vet they've ever seen. Um, you're already mentoring before you even do anything. You're already providing some inspiration. And I was actually at the airport um, yesterday, day before yesterday, um, and saw the first black female pilot I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, and I don't want to be a pilot, but I just felt like that's amazing. So I can only imagine these kids that have never seen a black vet before they walk in there and they must have a very similar experience, you know? Um, so it, to me, that helps take the pressure off. Um, when you think you're not doing enough, just, you know, being at your job, being good at your job, you're already doing it, you know? Thank you. Um, moving along, there's another question here from um, Stephanie. Are there particular things you wish your residency mentors slash faculty had done that they didn't do to make you feel like you belonged where you were? I don't, I don't think so. I, don't, I honestly can't say that they could have done much more. I mean, Dr. Daly was, uh, I mean, she was very you know, forthcoming with me about the way people would treat me and you know, things that she experienced. Um, you know, I, I think, I don't think that she, you know, held something back or, you know, when I got out, you know, I didn't go back and say, well, why didn't, how did you handle this situation? So I can't really say that, you know, but my residency was, I mean, it was just, it was small, you know, she took two residents for her whole career and I was one of them. So I didn't really have, I didn't really have something I felt like I missed out on or learn something profound in my residency. Um, I think she, she was pretty, like I said, forthcoming with everything with me. Yeah, I mean, I, I had um, Dr. Tom Kern at Cornell um, and I had like a, a struggle with my third year resume and also um, another faculty member. And 
I honestly, I've never felt so supported that even when I was on call by myself on Saturday, having a meltdown, who'd come in and just kind of sit there and just like sit in his office until I was done, whatever emergency I was seeing, just to make sure I was okay. So um, I, I was lucky that I, um, that's the one thing that I will say is when you're picking residents, if I was lucky enough to be offered a couple of residencies and I picked Cornell because of the mentorship, the location wasn't what I wanted because I wanted to be in a big city, but picking a residency because of mentorship is, 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 is a huge deal. And that also applies to your first job as well. Okay, well, I wanna take this moment to um, thank all of our panelists for being here tonight. We ran a little bit over time, so thank you for the, sticking with us for the last few minutes here. Um, I see some more questions in the chat. If you guys would like to email those questions, to me, I can forward them to the panelists and get answers to you guys um, as soon as everybody is available. Um, but once again, I, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Patricia Mundy, Dr. Forrest Cummings, Dr. Keisha Davis, and Dr. Lily Davis, and Dr. Joya Griffin for also being with us here tonight. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, everyone is aware that my email was at the top of the chat if you guys are looking for that. Um, and then potentially in the future, we may have more discussions like this. Um, so you guys keep a lookout for that, okay, coming from the MCVMA. Before we all go, I just want to say you also did a great job. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I you. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you to our moderator. <laughs> Amazing job. Amazing job moderating. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, um, Roxanne Sanchez. Anybody who wants to email her any additional questions, mcvmaoutreach at gmail.com. Excuse me. Um, and... We hope to do some more programming, um, bringing more uh, BIPOC specialists, and we're hoping to actually get a tech panel of um, tech specialists as well. <coughs> and um, we are also going to be joining with um, UGA's um, interim dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion to expand our first but not last series to include the first black veterinary specialists. So that's very exciting news. Um, so um, stay tuned for more, more programming from MCVMA. Um, if you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, thank you, thank you again to all of our panelists, all our participants and our lovely moderator. You guys thank have a good night. Again, guys. Thank have you. Good night. Good night. Good night.